to our God. So wherever you are, sing along. We're gonna have lyrics on screen. So let's celebrate our God this morning. Come let's on. go. This song talks about our God and how he needs to be praised. Our desires to worship you, Jehovah. Come on, put your hands together wherever you are. Hey. Put your hands together. Oh yeah. my morning into joy you turn my sorrow into gladness oh, many
Sure, come on, let me say You turn my sorrow into gladness oh, Many jazz, oh, many jazz are full of hearts You turn, you turn You turn my morning into joy oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You turn my sorrow the desperation of our hearts is that you shall be praised we pray that you shall be praised just because of who you are may you be praised for the things that you have done and the things that you continue to do in our lives Lord I really love this song and Lord I'm so grateful that you gave it to us that we may sing it back to you and so Lord we declare that you are the one that we want to follow now and forever our hearts are yielded to you, Jehovah God. We are trusting in you, Jehovah. For there's no other God like you, Lord. Hey! Come on, let's sing it together. Say, thought I could make it. Come on. Thought that I could do it. Thought that I could make it. Thought that I could build it on my own. Oh, yeah. But I've come to see that as I've tried to feel the void. Nothing else can feel the whole Be a fool Be a fool To gain the world And lose my soul Say, I choose you, Lord I choose Only you, you. Come on Only you Make this your declaration this morning Say, Jesus Jesus, you're the one I follow I give you my today, tomorrow I give you my today
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. We're so excited you could join us for worship. What an amazing time of worship led by our amazing worship team. I'm loving these new songs uh, and there's a whole bunch of them that's coming your way. Uh, and, and you know, one of, the, one of the things that really excites me, it's been a long time since we had a Mavuno uh, worship album, uh, but uh, the songs you're hearing and you've been hearing the last couple of weeks will actually be released very soon. I'm um, expecting the first one to be coming out anytime this coming month. And so I hope you're full of anticipation as I am. Uh, uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, and wow, what a blessing they already have been uh, to many, many of us. So thank you, worship team, and every one of those people who labor so hard behind the scenes to put together our online church every week. Uh, hey, like I said, my name is Moridi Wanjao, Senior Pastor of Mavuno Church. I'm so delighted to worship, uh, to welcome you to worship with us uh, this morning. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be just uh, uh, saying a prayer really quickly. I want to say a prayer and uh, as we give of our tithes and of our offerings, one of the things that we've been giving this whole year is uh, what we call our first fruits offering. Every year uh, we, we give our first fruit offering. You know, it's very interesting. One of the things I've discovered in the scripture is that every type of offering that the people in the Bible gave had a promise attached to it. And so whenever we give our tithes, there's a promise that God promised. Whenever we give 10% of our income, whenever we give our first fruit, our first fruit is whenever uh, the first income of the year or the first income in your business, uh, that's your first fruit. Whenever you give that, there's a promise attached to that as well. And so we've been giving our first fruits uh, offering and uh, uh, usually we give it until the end of the, the, the sixth month, which is uh, this weekend. <laughs> and so if you've been giving your, off, uh, your first fruit, you haven't brought it all in yet, I want to encourage you as much as possible to bring all of it uh, in uh, this week and over the next week. Uh, and, and I want to just read a scripture because it's one of the promises about giving. There are so many great promises uh, when we're about our, about, that come with generosity in the scripture. And this one is uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And I believe that God is saying that there are certain things, there are blessings already that He has promised to us. There are blessings already that He has given to us. Uh, the scriptures tell us that all blessings are already ours. Uh, but there are certain things that we do, we do to unlock those blessings. There are certain things that we do to begin to live a life where those blessings are actualized in our lives. And one of those is our generosity. Uh, that through our generosity, uh, it's not like God needs our money or anything like that. It's just that as we are generous with it, what, we are do, what are we doing? We are symbolizing uh, to, the, to the heavens and we're symbolizing to everybody around us and we're symbolizing to God Himself that everything we have comes from Him and that there's nothing we can do without His blessing. And as we do that, basically what are we doing? We're releasing because many of us, we hold on to our lives and to our wealth and to the things around us like this. There's a tight grip around it. But get, God is saying, listen, as you release, as you just open your hand and allow this, this is what generosity does, Guess what happens? This is a, it's, it's, it's a posture of giving, but it's also the posture of receiving. And it's only when we are generous that we are in a place where we are ready to receive. Because what we are symbolizing is, it was never mine in the first place. And the true giver is able to bless me much more 
then I can never be a blessing to his work and to others around me. And so I just want to thank God for all those generous people out there who've already learned this lesson among us. Uh, this is certainly one of the most generous churches I have ever come across. And I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. Allow me to just pray for us uh, as we come into God's Word. But before I pray, let me say that next week we're starting a, a brand new series, uh, uh, The X Factor. And it's going to be talking about the, the power of the Holy Spirit to just turbocharge your life. And maybe some of you, uh, this is something that I really believe this could end up being one of the most important series uh, that we do this year. And so please uh, invite your friends uh, next week to come and watch with you. Uh, hey, also this series that we've been going through, I think it's a very important series. It's, it's answering many questions and many objections that people have to Christianity. And so if you've got friends uh, who are Christians who just need to understand this because maybe their faith has been weakened by some of these questions, uh, please share with them the messages. And also if you've got friends who are not Christians uh, but would be interested in learning more, then again, share this. Put, these, put the links of this on your, on your social media pages and let's make Jesus famous, all right? So allow me to just lead us in a prayer together. Father, thank you so much for your children. Thank you for every single person who's watching this. Thank you for all the watch parties across the world. Uh, people who are sitting in homes, uh, watching Mavuno online together. Uh, thank you for those who are watching this even uh, or listening on their travels, uh, wherever they are at work or wherever it is. Uh, Lord, I just want to speak a special blessing over every one of us. Uh, you've promised us, Lord, that through our generosity, we begin to see you and discover you in new ways. And I pray that, Lord, as we seek to be generous uh, with whatever it is you've blessed us with, I pray that for every one of us, that, Lord, we will find your scripture to be true. We will find your word to be true. And as we hold on to the promises of God, we would actually see them actualizing in our lives. I pray for blessing for you in every way. May the Lord just open doors for you. May the dreams and asp uh, uh, aspirations of your life be fulfilled. May you see him as your father, the one who you will never outgive. Uh, may God's grace be upon you and upon those whom you love. And now, Lord, as, I pray, uh, as, as we pray, we ask that you'd open our hearts that we would hear and apprehend your word. That, Lord, it would transform us and help us be everything you want us to be. And we pray this with full faith in you, believing and trusting in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And God's people say it together. Amen. Amen. Greetings, uh, family. It's so good to see you again today, uh, a special Sunday, uh, the end of a month when we've had such an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. My name, as I said before, is Pastor M, uh, Senior Pastor of Mavuno Church, a movement of churches that is spread out across the world and spreading, coming to a city near you if you don't have one yet. And I'm so honored to be bringing God's Word to you today at the end of this amazing series. We've been going through a, 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 this series called Mythbusters, Busting Popular Myths About Christianity. And it's been a good series, an important series. I'm very passionate about it because it's so critical for all of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus to understand 
the basics of our faith. I believe that even as you go through this series, it's giving you thoughts, it's giving you an intellectual underlying for why you believe what you believe. And for those of you who don't know Jesus, uh, my prayer is that this is also giving you an opportunity, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, an opportunity to understand what it is that following Jesus entails. The first uh, myth we observed, because we're exploring myths about Christianity, is that a Christian is a person who goes to church and does good things. Because many people, that's what they think a Christian uh, tries to do. It's, it's about being a moral person. And we said, no, 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 no. That could not be farther from the truth. The reason Jesus came was not to make you a nice person, but to end your rebellion. That's what we learned as we looked at the scripture. And that, therefore, a Christian is somebody who's fully surrendered their life to God's rule and leadership. And we realize that there's a major disparity between what people think a Christian is and what actually the Bible teaches a Christian is. Our second myth was one that says all evil and suffering in the world proves that there is no God. And many people believe this. But as we looked through the scriptures, we actually looked and, and as we looked at the evidence, we, we saw that evil... Rather than pointing us to the absence of God, <laughs> what it actually does is actually shows us the reason why we need a God and why we need God. And, 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 and that was, uh, I, I really enjoyed that one. <laughs> Last week, we looked at a third one, a third popular myth that all religions are the same. Many people believe all religions are actually just the same path to get to the same destination. And this one was the first one that we actually saw was true. <laughs> all religions are humans' attempts to restore relationship with God, to restore something that they know is broken. And we realize that all religions are inadequate for that purpose. But in Jesus, God sent out his own way, a path where he himself restores the relationship with human beings. And we learned that, you know, we must give up on religion. It doesn't work. Instead, we must try relationship because that's what God offers to us. And in case you missed any of these messages, I just want to recommend you go to the Mavuno uh, Church uh, YouTube page, Mavuno Church Org YouTube page, and you'll be able to find that you can catch up with those, share them with friends uh, who would be struggling with these things or who just want to grow in their wisdom. Now, a final myth that we want to look at today is one that is popular in many parts of the African continent, and it's one that says that Christianity is a Western religion. Uh, this one also is popular if you live in, in Asia, if you live in Latin America. I mean, people will often point and say, this is a, it's an import. This is something that was brought by Westerners to colonize us. I, I, it's a pretty common belief today. Actually, many see Christianity as a tool that the colonizers used to pacify different populations, including Africans. Uh, Jomo Kenyatta, Kenya's founding president, was famously quoted as having said, when the missionaries arrived, <laughs> they had their Bible. They taught us how to pray with our eyes closed. When we opened them, they had our land and we had their Bible. It's like they used the Bible to just con us and, and take our land away from us. So how do we go about exploring the validity of this belief? Because many people hold this belief. And I believe the first place I want us to look at is the Bible, the account in the scripture. Because interestingly, according to Bible texts, the history of Christianity in Africa begins right from where the book of Acts, uh, right from the book of Acts when the church, the early church was founded. And I want to look at just a few references today. I want to start with Mark chapter 15 verse 21. And it says, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. Of course, if you've read the story of Jesus, he was crucified on the cross. He was on his way to be crucified by the Romans when they found this innocent bystander and they forced him to carry the cross because Jesus was, was exhausted by that point from the torture they had put on him. Now, Cyrene, if you don't know this, is actually a place that was located in Northern Africa, uh, modern day uh, Libya, the eastern part of Libya. And so the scripture is telling us that the man who helped Jesus carry his cross was an African. Come on, somebody. I mean, this is so interesting. And this man, Mark tells us not only that, that he had two sons. He says, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And then notice this. He doesn't explain who they were. Because his assumption is everybody reading who knew who these two were. Because these two are most likely lead, well-known leaders or members of the early church which is why he can mention them and not bother to explain who they were. And so right from the beginning, you're seeing clues that Africans were playing an important role in the early church. Second text comes from the response. When, when, when the Holy Spirit first came and the early church began, it's, that story is told for us in Acts chapter, seven, uh, ch Acts chapter 2, uh, starting from verse 7, I want to read something that the first sermon ever preached in a church or by a church. And it says, utterly amazed. They asked, these are the people who are responding to that message. They asked, and all those who are speaking Galileans, how then is it that each of us is hearing them in our own native language? 
Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? So basically what's happening, Dr. Luke, the writer of this, is telling us that on the day of Pentecost, the first sermon that the Apostle Peter preaches, the first ever sermon preached uh, by a church leader, and what happens is a whole bunch of nationalities present, and they're shocked because the same message is heard by each of them in their own native language. That's a, a miracle, the first miracle in the early church. And this crowd, as you look at all the nationalities, you're going to find that there were Egyptians and Cyrenians. As you know, both places are in Africa. So right, the first sermon, there were Africans in the crowd. Uh, this was, and, and they're Arabs, and they're people from different nationalities. That's the first sermon that was ever preached in a church. The third text talks about an encounter with an important African official. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 26, you're going to read a very interesting thing happening there. It says, An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Philip was one of the early church leaders, Go south to the road, on the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he, Philip, started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in the charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in the chariot, in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Now Kandake was the name given to all female rulers in the kingdom of Cush. Cush was a part of modern day Sudan. <laughs> and, and the word Ethiopian, it's actually, it was, it was not, there was not, they didn't have a country called Ethiopia at the time. Ethiopian was a Greek term for black-skinned people. So generally, it was applied to people from Cush. And Cush is a country, is, a, is, a, is an, a, an area that was well known to the Hebrews. It's mentioned many times in the Old Testament. And so here we have an account of God sending one of the church leaders, an important church leader, to share the gospel with somebody because this person was so important they needed to, to have the, the gospel shared to them sent by, to, by a person sent by the Spirit directly to them. And this person was a high-ranking government official. This man, uh, an official of the Queen of Cush, uh, he, uh, he, got, uh, he received the gospel, he got baptized, and, and, and many people say that he actually was one of the people who took the gospel down uh, towards the southern part uh, of uh, the, uh, a little so more south in Africa. And later on, you're going to read more texts. I mean, this is, I, I'm, I'm hoping you're beginning to see uh, a pattern here. Uh, the church was persecuted in Jerusalem. You, you might know that story. And people had to flee. All the Christians had to flee from Jerusalem because there's a lot of persecution. Uh, uh, and, and what happened next was amazing because Acts chapter 11 continues that story. It tells us in verse 19, now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So you see, the early church initially believed that the gospel was only for the Jews. But what happened is that these people from Cyrene, <laughs> were, which I told you is in Libya, were some of the first people who decided this gospel must be preached to other people who are not Jews. And here we see a story of Africans from Cyrene preaching the gospel to Europeans. The first missions to Europe were done by Africans. And they were doing it in a place called uh, Antioch, which is in Turkey. So Africans preaching the gospel to Europeans in Asia. Come on, somebody. I mean, this is crazy. When you read the scripture, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know. Many people say, I didn't know this. Isn't that something? And then the last one, I'm going to look at one more scripture. I know that I'm taking you through a bit of a marathon this morning. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. It says, now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Saul is a great apostle, Paul. This extremely influential church, this church in Antioch was a church that God used to spread the gospel across the whole world. And it tells us that right from the beginning, they had a multinational, interracial uh, team of leaders. And among that team, two out of the five were from Africa. Simon called Niger. Niger it, that basically is talking about, he's called Niger because he was black. He's like, hey, black guy. <laughs> and Lucius of Cyrene, again, was from Libya. And both of these were Africans. Two out of five of the key leaders in this amazing church were actually Africans. So, so scripture tells us that right from ground zero, right from when the church was founded, 
uh, Africans were playing a major role. And if I was preaching this from Asia, I could show you that there were Asians there as well. If I was preaching this from the Middle East, I'll show you actually most of the leaders were from the Middle East. Early church history has, uh, uh, has many things that tell us that Christianity has, was not. Actually, it became a West. It, it, it flowed uh, to, to the West much later. Now, it's interesting. I can talk about church history as well, not just uh, uh, scripture. Because uh, history tells us that St. Mark who was one of the, 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 the writers of the Gospels. He's the one who brought the Gospel from Jerusalem to Alexandria in Egypt, uh, about 60 AD. 60 AD was very, very early in the history of the church. And from there, it spread west to Carthage and south to Ethiopia. Uh, and so by the time the first Anglo-Saxons, the people in Britain were being converted, Ethiopian Christianity was in its 10th generation. What a shock. I mean, by the, by the time these guys in, in, in Britain uh, were being converted, there was Christianity in Ethiopia for ten, that had been 10 generations already. And by the 4th century AD, an Ethiopian king known as Azana, he made Christianity the official religion of Ethiopia. Can you believe it? 4th century AD. Uh, that's the same century that Constantine was making Christianity the official re religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, there was already a Christian empire in Africa. And another kingdom called Aksum, which again, you can do all this research, go on, on Wikipedia, go on internet and you see it. This kingdom called Aksum also declared Christianity to the official religion in the 4th century. So as the Roman Empire was turning Christian, there were already two very strong established Christian kingdoms in Africa. And by the 6th century, just a couple of centuries later, there were Nubian kingdoms. Uh, and in Kenya, we still have a, a large community of Nubians. Uh, there were already Nubian kingdoms uh, that had done the same. At least three kingdoms, Nobachia, Makuria, and Alodia. I'm giving you a lot of history this morning, but just, it's just to show you. These were actually Christian kingdoms in Africa. At the time that Britain was still mostly under the influence of what you'd call pagan religions. People worshipping trees and the sun and the moon. There are Christian kingdoms in England. I'm not saying this in any way to disparage any part of the world. I'm just trying to show you that Christianity did not come from the West to Africa. There was a lot of Christianity already by the time the Westerners were discovering this continent. The most important theologians uh, in Christian history, many of them came from Africa. Uh, if you study church history, you're going to find out names like Tertullian, Perpetua, Felicity, uh, Clement of Alexandria. You're going to find out names like Origen, uh, Cyprian, Athanasius, and one very important one, Augustine of Hippo. Augustine came from a place called Hippo, which is actually in, in, uh, in Algeria. <laughs> Again, Northern Africa. And he's credited as the person who clearly formulated the doctrine of original sin and of the Trinity. So the things we believe and we speak in our creeds, he's the first person who actually said, this is what Jesus taught. And this is what they actually mean to the church. And, and, and he's the one who influenced, actually his writings greatly influenced Martin Luther in the 16th century in the uh, Protestant Revolution. Actually, church historians say that next to St. Paul of Tarsus, the most important theologian in the Christian church is Augustine of Hippo. He was an African. I, 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 I hope somebody is beginning to get a picture here of what's happening here. Now, some of you might say, oh, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, these are actually Ara Ar Arabic spaces. But I need you to understand, that's actually a, not, that's a modern thing. <laughs> By the century, 7th century, all those places were actually Christian areas. Very highly Christianized. But what happened in, in the 7th century is that there was a huge, uh, what would I call it? A huge persecution by Islamic armies that came to Northern Africa and burnt churches and forced people to change to Islam. So most of the Christians in Northern Africa had to flee to Europe or actually change to become Islamic. Uh, very few churches remained. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church in, in, in Egypt, the Coptic Orthodox Church of Egypt, and the church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church remained. But everybody else was converted, and that's how Northern Africa became Islamic. That was not its origin. And so you need to understand, actually, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church today has 54 million people. Uh, that's a church that has nothing to do, the, the gospel did not come through any part of the West. It's originally there, long before the Western missionaries. And we know that in the 19th century, there was a lot of Christian missions that came and brought Christianity, uh, reintroduced Christianity to parts, especially sub-Saharan Africa. But Christianity had been at home on the African continent long before that. I'm hoping that somebody's mind today, I mean, you came to church today and hopefully today your mind was awake enough to receive some of the things I'm teaching.
But I want to say this, uh, the last thing I'll say about church history, the interesting thing that many of us have is the picture of Jesus as a blonde, blue-eyed, white person. Uh, like the guy who has locks, you know, he could be in a shampoo commercial. Uh, the guy was just like the Jesus film, that really amazing uh, actor who acts in that place. But Jesus was actually from the Middle East. Uh, he had brown skin and dark eyes, probably looked like, more like what we picture of an Arabic guy. He looked more like the terrorist you see in the, in the American movies than he does the, 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 the secret agent. Uh, he, he, he would have looked more like an Arab than a Westerner. Actually, the BBC did an article uh, to, to ask what would Jesus have really looked like? Would he have looked as Nordic, as blonde as they show him in the, in the movies? And they concluded he actually looked a lot more like an African. And I'm, uh, the picture on the screen right now uh, is showing you what they actually concluded. What a shock! Oh my goodness, who would have thought? I mean, can you imagine? Have you ever prayed with a picture of Jesus looking like that? Or is your picture that blonde, blue-eyed uh, person? Uh, my goodness, I mean, I'm hoping somebody's mind is right now being opened to just begin to understand that it's a lot more than we thought. Our conclusion after this brief investigation is that the belief that Christianity is a Western religion is completely false and unfounded. This myth, we've busted. It doesn't, it's not true. It doesn't hold any water. If there's something unique about the gospel, is the Bible teaching that God is the God of the whole earth. God is not a God of the Middle East. He's not a God of Europe. He's not a God of Africa. He's a God of the whole earth. Psalm 24 verse 1 says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And there's a powerful scripture that, that for me helps me summarize uh, and, and maybe conclude this message. Because Paul was visiting the, uh, the, the city of Athens, which is an, a European city. So this Middle Eastern uh, uh, evangelist is out in a European city. Athens was a center of culture and knowledge. It was an ancient uh, center, no longer politically important, but still a center of culture. And the people loved there, it was like a university city. People loved following and discussing the latest trending news. Everybody was about what's, what are the latest ideas. And Paul, being a Jew, visiting that place would have looked like he'd have been more like a rural guy visiting an important urban city. Uh, and he toured their city. And he noticed that they had many, many idols all over the place. They were very sophisticated, even in their religions. And the, uh, actually, the ancient writers tell us there were at least 30,000 gods in Athens alone that were worshipped in, in Athens. Like all of them had their own statues, their own temples, their own places of worship. And Paul had a conversation with the leading intellectuals of that city. And in Acts chapter 17, verse 22, he says this. It says, Paul stood up in the meeting of the Aeropagus. This is a place where they would stand in the marketplace and discuss the latest ideas. It's like he was giving his TED talk uh, to the intellectuals of the day. And he said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of you, your poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that, a divine, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God looked, overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands people, all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the, the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. And some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Aeropagus, Also a woman called Damaris and a number of others. Now, I wish we had more time to, to look at this story. It's an amazing story, and it's got so many rich things that Paul teaches. But the one important fact I want to point out, in fact, I'll maybe I'll point out a couple. The, the first one is Paul did not criticize the Athenians or act like he was more spiritual than them. He didn't look down on their culture. 
or on their beliefs. In fact, he began by affirming something very good about them. He said, I see that in every way you're very religious. I mean, that's awesome. I'm glad you're religious people. I mean, see, Paul had taken time to listen to them, to understand their culture. He could see their brokenness, their empty worship of idols. But he could also see something beautiful about them. They had a hunger for God. And this hunger is what caused them to be very religious. So he affirmed that. He realized they had many idols, but they had reached a place. In fact, these guys were so intellectual. They had reached a place where they said, we're not even sure we've covered all the bases, all the gods out there. So just in case, let's put up one for an unknown god. And Paul actually said, my goodness, I'm so impressed by you guys. You're so smart. You even have one for the unknown god. And then he said, let me show you who this unknown god you've been worshipping is. Let me show you the center of your faith. And on that common ground, he was able to introduce them to the God who made the world and everything in it. You see, because God is the creator of the whole world, there are traces of beauty in every culture. Uh, every culture reflects God's image. But also because of human sinfulness, which we've looked at in this series, there are idols in every culture that reflect our brokenness. The idols and brokenness of our culture are easier to see. I mean, whether it's corruption, if you're in, if you're in Kenya, <laughs> the blind pursuit of wealth that causes us to take shortcuts at whatever opportunity we can, very individualistic. Or whether it's negative ethnicity, the belief that your people are superior to others and you must protect your people from others. Or whether it's lust and promiscuity that is destroying our relationships. These are principalities. These are negative things in our culture. They, they are in our culture, but they are terrible and they destroy our culture and there's no way we can excuse them. However, if you're patient and listening, you will actually see that there are beautiful things in every culture that are starting points for the gospel. And whatever culture you come from, there are amazing things that reflect God's image. And, and God, what, what God is saying is, wherever you go, He's already gone there before you. He's already in that culture. And what you need to do if you're going to teach people about Jesus is to join God in whatever He's already doing. And Paul joins them. He says, this God you had, let me show you who He is. You see, that's not what... Many times what the Western missionaries did when they came uh, to Africa, and, and, and they, they, as much as they did a fantastic job, there were some mistakes they made. For example, when missionaries came to Kenya, they taught us to take Western names to symbolize we are now Christians. Uh, and, and, and many times I get confused when people ask me, what's your Christian name? I tell them, I'm Moravi Wanjal. They say, what's your Christian name? I'm, it's like they probably mean, what's your English name? Because in their minds, it's more Christian to have a name like Edward or Sandra. Uh, and no offense if you're called one of those names. Uh, but you know, Moravi, my name means a shepherd. And what's more Christian than a shepherd? Because the Bible says that Jesus is the good shepherd. So, so our, our culture already had beautiful forms that it's very easy to come and say, let me show you why you have these names and to, to honor and dignify what God has already put in the culture. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and let me just say, there are many examples like those that cause people to see Christianity as a Western imposition. Uh, uh, I, I, in my culture, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, it was very common when you are having a drink to honor those who had gone before you. You pour something as a libation on the ground. And the missionaries saw this as devil worship. Actually, I don't believe it. I think that there was something very powerful about acknowledging that we belong to a long line of people who've gone before us. Uh, the Swahili referred to their ancestors as Pepo. Uh, Pepo really means ancestors. Uh, it, it really has to do with the spirit or the wind. Uh, but the missionaries felt this, uh, that this was devil worship. And so they called, when they translated the Bible, they wrote the word they used for demons <laughs> was actually the word we use for ancestors. Uh, so you can see how you can demonize a culture as opposed to dignifying what God has already put there. And that's one of the reasons why many people today would think of Christianity as a Western import. Even though God himself created our culture. Now, the interesting thing is that in his sermon, Paul did not quote the scriptures even once. He actually <laughs> dignified what was already, he quoted the artists. If you look at the word, he says, in him we live and move and have our being. <laughs> These were famous words by one of the most philosoph uh, important philosophers of their time. And, and he, uh, we are his offspring. Those were words of a stoic poet, a poet who was also quoted greatly in their time. And instead of using the scripture to, to, to prove that there was a God, he used their own writings. He used their own uh, 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 poetic and, and their spoken word artists of the day. Uh, Paul was not afraid to use the language and the cultural forms that his audience were familiar with to share the good news of Jesus. And as a result, we are told several people believed powerful thing that we need to understand that God has already gone before us in every culture and there are things in every culture that shout about him that point to the fact that he's already there I love verse 26 to 27 it says from one man he that is God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth 
and he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God created all the cultures. And verse 27 says, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, even though he's not far from any one of us. So, so God created your culture, whatever culture you came from. It was made by this same God of heaven and earth. And he made us unique so that we can find him in that place. God wants us to find him in our culture uniquely. There's something every culture has to offer uh, to the following of Jesus. And the gospel has nothing to do with accepting Western culture or Western names, even Jewish culture. But it's in affirming how God is already at work in our culture and helping God, Jesus, uh, and, and helping people that see that Jesus is the answer to all the aspirations of every human culture. So listen to me. I, I think I want to just uh, wrap this up by saying it doesn't matter where you come from or who you are. We are all invited to have a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus. And the incredible thing about a relationship with Jesus is He doesn't expect you to change your culture, your last name, the way you speak, or even the way you dress. He accepts you just as you are. Uh, there are beautiful things that were created in your culture that God is, He wants to affirm those. There are things in your culture that God will say, uh, this one maybe is not something that, uh, that reflects me. And, and, and He will help you overcome. But He wants you to worship Him in the way in your culture. Don't, don't allow cultural or religious barriers come in the way of truly experiencing Jesus. I want to say this because in our culture right now, there are many people teaching that you need to go back to African religions, need to go back to African cultures. And this is a lack of understanding of what the gospel uh, is about. Remember, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. Come on, somebody. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Now, next week, we're going to be starting a brand new series called The X Factor. And it's about how the Holy Spirit, uh, this, this very, very un unknown for many people, power that can supercharge your life. And I'm totally excited about it. If you've ever thought about what, what, does, what does God's power mean for me as an individual, uh, you want to come next week and invite a friend or a neighbor to watch with you. Uh, have a watch party in your house. Don't watch by yourself. Don't be selfish. Share the good news with others. Invite your friends, your relatives to watch it with you. Even this message, share it with others. And I want to, uh, uh, as I conclude, just to pray for anyone here who would like to, who finally understood what it, does it mean to follow God, to understand that, my goodness, God is not this God of the Europeans. He's not a God of the Jews. He's a God for every culture. He's a God for my culture as well. And you, maybe you've understood today why it's important for you to be in a relationship with Jesus, with, with the God of the whole earth. And if that's you, I want to invite you today to just pray a very simple prayer with me. If you would just bow your head right now and say these words with me. Uh, Dear Jesus, I come to you today to surrender my life to you. I finally get it why I must follow you. I will no longer run my own life, but I surrender it to you. Come into my life. Transform me and make me to be everything that you created me to be. From today, I am yours and I will follow you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hey, if you've prayed that prayer, congratulations. I'm so excited for you. Please send an email to us. Send me an email, uh, info at mavunochurch.org. I'd love to send you some information to help you take the next steps into growing into everything that God created you to be. Uh, there's a unique purpose that God created for you for and, that, and that's why He put you in the family He put you in. That's why He put you in the culture He put you in. And I believe that God wants to help you discover that. It would be such, it would be such a joy for us to help you walk that journey. So send us an email and we'd love to get with you. Hey, I want to just speak a blessing over everybody else in the house today. Father, bless your children. Uh, may the God of peace uh, equip you, bless you, equip you with everything that is good for doing His will. And may He work in you that which is pleasant to Him uh, to, uh, to, to the glory, that He may receive glory in your life. Uh, may you become somebody who is confident in your faith. May you become a strong pillar somebody who's able to represent Him, the one who created you. May you receive much joy as you live a life of purpose, a life where your life impacts many people beyond yourself. Uh, I speak this blessing over you. And as you go out into this week, may this week be full of victory and testimony of God's goodness and mercy in your life. I speak this blessing over you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together, Amen. Amen and Amen.